Greetings agents, the anomaly we'll be exploring today is a human identity with a peculiar challenge for ending up in the wrong place at the wrong time. We'll conclude with an interview that once again highlights the questionable practices of the SCP Foundation. Item number SCP-507, Object Class, Safe, Special Containment Procedures, SCP-507 is allowed free roam of the facility obviously bearing anything that would breach security or safety protocols. Any time SCP-507 leaves its private quarters, it must be accompanied by an agent, mostly at this point, to make sure that it does not shift without the facility's knowledge. SCP-507 should not be physically touched if there have been more than two weeks since its last shift. The risks inherent in disobeying this protocol make the action its own punishment, should the issue of disciplinary measures ever come up. When SCP-507 undergoes a shift, faculty will be informed to keep an eye out for its eventual reappearance. It also has a tracking device implanted into it, and a daily signal check should verify whether or not SCP-507 has returned from its trip. If it reappears in or nearby the facility, SCP-507 will return to its quarters on its own. Otherwise, a retrieval team of three plain clothes agents may be sent to provide transportation back. Upon successful return, SCP-507 can be the subject of various physical tests up until two weeks after each shift. It is worth noting that SCP-507 is allowed a computer with an internet connection via a proxy which strictly limits what information can be uploaded and to where, in its room, and may petition to use, meet with, act as a test subject for safe or Euclid class SCPs that do not affect mental functions negatively or carry an infectious trait. This is a result of SCP-507's persistently clean record, and the implication that if SCP-507 was ever going to be a security leak, it would have used its Fox teleportation powers to do so already. It is also worth considering that SCP-507 is actually below average in most physical traits, and that, in even worst case scenarios, any SCP agent would be more than capable of carrying out a termination order. Description SCP-507 is a Caucasian male with blonde hair and green eyes, sporting no other outstanding characteristics besides being somewhat overweight and speaking with a vague accent of disputable origin. Although SCP-507 has an already established name due to its unremarkable upbringing, it seems to find entertainment in forcing those it meets to give it a nickname in lieu of divulging this information. Thus, SCP-507 will now respond to the names Tommy, Steve, Bruto, Guy, Houdini, and Gravnok the Destroyer. SCP-507 was originally recovered from the Asylum, when standard surveillance following repeated successful escape attempts brought its abilities to light. All records of this incident were confiscated, and SCP-507 was taken into custody under the pretense of moving it to a more secure facility. The original theory was that SCP-507 possessed some form of teleportation ability, as it would suddenly disappear and eventually reappear in a different location. Subsequent interviews with the subject did verify that its ability could be used in such a manner, but that it was merely a side effect for its main affliction. SCP-507 holds that during its periods of disappearance, it is actually displaced into a random alternate reality. The landscape generally stays the same, but the inhabitants and climate of the parallel world often do not. SCP-507 also insists that it has no control over the time and duration of these shifts. This has more or less been confirmed by the subject being known to displace at its convenient times, such as mid-sentence, while sleeping, or even while using on-site public facilities. If SCP-507 moves about in the alternate world, the eventual shift back will then place it at a corresponding area in our reality. A sample list of SCP-507's descriptions of alternate realities can be found in document 507-00. Mentally, SCP-507 shows no large deviations from the psychological profile for a normal person. It has confessed to have always had a great interest in the paranormal and mythological, which has directly led to its eventual permission to interact with relatively harmless SCPs. SCP-507 especially enjoys meeting with other sentient SCPs, once going so far 
as to request a small vacation to visit SCP-082. The request was eventually granted after persistent pleading from SCP-507, and the meeting was thankfully uneventful. Document 507-00 A sample list of SCP-507 supposed extradimensional travels, along with any demands made by it after returning. Subject arrived in complete darkness, leading it to assume that the current location was indoors or subterranean. After fumbling about for a possible way out, Subject heard a sound akin to muted breathing nearby. Subject then decided to curl up in the nearest corner and wait it out, instead of risking a blind confrontation with an unknown creature. Request a standard flashlight, which it now always carries on its person. Subject appeared in a replica of the facility, although apparently fallen into disuse. Further exploration led to the discovery of various corpses strewn about the area, all heavily decayed and covered in an odd type of mold. Upon noting that the corpses seemed to rhythmically expand and contract as if still breathing, Subject attempted to leave the facility. The idea was quickly discarded when it opened an exit and found that the outside world was apparently coated with the same odd growth. Request Heavy doses of voriconazole and a fungal expert to help ascertain the nature of the mold. No exact match of the described mold was found, but it was noted to share many attributes with certain types of cordyceps fungi. See Addendum 507-02 Upon reappearing, Subject was reported to mother, so many spiders. Subject refused to elaborate. Request, a handheld firearm of any type. Request was granted under the stipulation that said firearm is specifically built to only use rubber bullets. Subject once again appeared in a pitch black location with breathing nearby. Upon turning on its flashlight, Subject was surprised by a man wearing a black business suit and sunglasses with an impossibly wide smile. Said smiling man was apparently leaning in towards SCP-507 when it turned on the light, the end result being that their faces were almost touching. Smiling man then remarked, back so soon? Before subject switched the light off again, discharged all the rounds in its firearm at the general vicinity of the man, and once more curled up into the nearest corner until shifted back into our reality. Request, none. Those with level 2 security clearance may read a full list by accessing document 507-3b. Those with level 2 slash 507 security clearance should also see interview 507-g for evidence of a particular noteworthy shift. Addendum 507-00 Agent went missing on At the same time as SCP-507, a full-scale search was launched to find either of them only for SCP-507 to appear a week later. When questioned, it said that was holding onto its shoulder when it shifted, leading to all of them to appear in an alternate dimension where during the ensuing chaos, SCP-507 lost contact with and could not relocate him before it shifted back into our standard reality. A new protocol has been placed in light of this. No one is to come in physical contact with SCP-507 after two weeks following a displacement. Re-evaluation of previous incidents has shown that there have always been at least two weeks between each, so this time frame will be the only safe time to touch SCP-507 until further notice. Addendum 507-01 I don't care how much he grumbles about it, SCP-507 is not to be cleared for challenging SCP-076-2 to 50 rounds of tic tac though. Just no. Doctor Addendum 507-02 Fungus encountered by SCP-507 seems similar to that resulting from experimentation with SCP-407. Interview 507-G Interviewed SCP-507 and SCP-507 Interviewer Doctor Forward During a daily signal check for SCP-507, two independent verifications were returned. The following investigation led to the discovery of identical SCP-507 duplicates in its assigned quarters. Both apparently made their way to the room by themselves, and had spent at least half an hour conversing with each other upon meeting. The following interview took place between them 
and the first informer employee to reach their location. The duplicates had been each given an alphabetical notation for the purpose of readability. Begin, though. Hey, Doc. Welcome to the party. I am afraid you are going to have to explain this to me. There's apparently more than one version of me with this problem. Should have seen this coming, honestly. There are so many ways an alternate reality could differ without affecting my personal life, you know? So, which one of you is the visitor? Roughly 10 seconds of silence. Is something wrong? We've actually been talking about this for a bit. Now you guys have been real nice to us. More than we might deserve, really. But we also know that this could be a rather enticing opportunity for your research department. It'd probably be best if you didn't know which one of us was... Temporary? Expendable. I don't know what kind of stories you two have been sharing, but our job is to secure and protect the likes of you. Perhaps this other reality has a less benign code of conduct? And perhaps I can shoot fireballs from my mouth. We don't mean to be hurtful, but this place isn't the best source of human compassion. I'm sure that there's at least one person on staff who would love breaking me open in an attempt to find out how all this freaky stuff works, if it wasn't for the fact that you couldn't keep studying me afterwards. Do you have to put it like that? I have enough things to keep me awake at night. Good god, I know. Once there was this guy with a huge ass smile. You met him too? Nearly soiled myself. I wish I was that lucky. You know, this could be interpreted as a security breach. Who's the doppelganger going to report to? Alternate SCP? I'm fairly sure that there's a better chance of a meteor striking this place than successful cross-dimensional sabotage. I've actually come across at least three dimensions where something fell from. You're not helping. I rarely do. Anyway, where were- 507-B disappears mid-sentence. Roughly five seconds of silence follows. Well, now that our visitor has left, I have a question. Alright. Did you two figure out the difference between your realities? Actually, I think we did. In his world, Abraham Lincoln was killed while sleeping by his vice president, instead of by General Lee. In this reality, both assassinated Lincoln. Oh sh- End law. Closing statement. Subsequent testing revealed that the CP-507's abilities have no biological basis and that severed pieces will still shift along with the main body. The SCP-507 of this reality reappeared three days later, and has not been informed of this incident. End law. 507's travels offer an intriguing glimpse into parallel worlds. Although they may seem harmless, these jumps carry the significant risk of bringing inhabitants from these dimensions into our own. 507 is an open door inviting anything from an invasive species to a catastrophic plague or even an uncontrollable anomaly into our world. The interview makes it clear that the SCP Foundation could easily eliminate the latent risk posed by SCP-507, but they choose to keep it around, always seeking to exploit its abilities regardless of the possible consequences. Neither the constant trauma to which the subject is exposed, nor the potential benefits the Foundation believes it can gain justified the rest of its existence. Help us continue our work with your comments and suggestions below. I am Virus Anonimo. we are the GOC, and you have been informed. <laughs>